Girls need modems. Rosie Cross. A gender changer figures out how her computer works, and she is not afraid of taking it apart. Gender Changers Academy. This glitch is a correction to the machine. Legacy Russell. So these excerpts that you're hearing and the slides behind you are a preview of the Cyber Feminism Index in print, um, which is coming out in October with Inventory Press. We've been working on this project for several years, so it's really exciting to see it finally come together. So today I'm going to give you a visual introduction to three decades of cyber feminism history, and you'll be able to get a sense of its mutation and its rhizomatic quality. So what is cyber feminism? You'll notice that many of the images in this presentation are very low res. I think this sticker um, is about 12 kilobytes. It was pulled from a 1997 website by the Old Boys Network. This question is a little tricky because everyone has a very different answer um, intentionally, so I'll give you mine now. Perhaps the best way of understanding this term is to break apart the word itself. So this prefix cyber was pulled from cybernetics by Norbert Wiener in the 1940s. Later, cyber was fixed to space to become cyberspace uh, and William Gibson's Neuromancer. This uh, 1980s science fiction novel was really important for many reasons. It kind of predicted a lot of the sensory networked computing rhetoric that we're hearing in modern discussions about the metaverse. Um, however, it was also very characterized by fembots and cyber babes and depictions of the male gaze. So when cyber was finally fixed to feminism, cyber feminism, in 1991, by Sadie Plant and VNS Matrix, it was really considered a provocation or an oxymoron. How can women and these marginalized communities uh, re-examine and reshape and predict what this cyberspace or techno-utopia or dystopia might look like? So you'll also notice that I'm using a website. Um, this is live. You're able to reference this now and later on if you go to mindysue.com slash girls, G-R-R. Um, what I like about the browser is it's essentially a page viewer. It's also live. And we can kind of look under the hood. So here is the source code. I'm using HTML comments as my lecture notes. So if I don't say a citation or a date or a name, you can find it here. And I also just want to give a shout out to Emma Ray Brummel, who I first saw do this HTML lecture, HTML comments as lecture format. And you can visit their uh, lecture here, this GitHub link. I also wanted to give a quick note, a not safe for work warning. Um, this is all situated in a, an artistic context, but I did want to let you know that this lecture will include some profane language, some depictions of nudity, though always in an artistic setting, and also a trigger warning that some of the pieces also talk about sexual assault, and because of the context, misogyny, racism, and sexism. So if you're watching from home and you're at work, maybe turn off the, the video, um, but also give a way to beat in case anyone wants to reshuffle here. All right, so I've organized this into 12 very loose themes, and the first is code. So in 1994, Australian artist and poet Mez Breeze began to develop an online language she called Mezengel that combined programming language and informal English. This reads, crash, I write to, I write to, I run through, and blood. I run the urge, I write to, speak. And in 1995, Orphan Drift created the work Cyber Positive. Here, the programming language is printed and presented alongside English to create poetry. And an excerpt reads, change for the machines, that's all we've ever done. Language breaks down over the abysmal waters flash, waiting, epileptic, epileptic in all dimensions, time stops. And in this 2018 Manifiesto por Algoritmias Hack Feministas, or Manifesto for Hack Feminist Algorithms, Liliana Zaragoza-Cano, Natasha Felizzi, 
and Anna Christina Joachim inherit the structure of scripting to write script, while I equals algoritmo misogyno colonial racista e sexista, if I equals algoritmia hack feminista heart, then break. And in 2019, Alejandro Banos created in digital. If you can bead, you already know how to code. Else if you can play the drum, you can code. Else if you let your imagination drive you, you can code. Else you can code in digital. So in the burgeoning landscape of web 1.0, Many artists were publishing and coding their own works, embracing the limited affordances of HTML and CSS to really self-style their works in the browser. So an emerging form then was hypertext fiction, where by clicking various links in the text, you could choose your own adventure and create multiple avenues for reading narratives. Here we see the uh, net art piece Fight by Melinda Rackham from 1995. The transcription reads, she who lurks beneath, the libertine, the whore, the hysteric, the ugly, the monstrous, she is there, feeding, nurturing, supporting, encouraging, the beautiful one, the successful one, the surface dweller. And in 1997, Cornelia Solfrank created Female Extension. Um, in an excerpt from Rhizome, during the Hamburger Kunsthal, when they announced extension, a competition for net art, Cornelia Solfrank created 300 fake female submissions as data trash. Um, and as it turns out, the top three awards were still given to men. And here we have Women's Net, which was created in 1998 by Henriette Esther Hussein, Colleen Lomorna, and the goal of Women's Net was to empower South African women to use cyberspace as a tool for mobilization towards advancing women's equality. And because many of these websites are no longer available online, they were scraped through the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine or Rhizome's Conifer. So sometimes you have a lot of broken elements, like some of these missing images here. But still, because the format used a very simple HTML and CSS structure, we're still able to really get a sense of the typographical and compositional intent. And similarly, in a very simple HTML um, half-column design is uh, the Wor World Indigenous Register by Cheryl Hillerondel, made in uh, uh, 2002. So another visual theme is the inherited interface, in which artists use the interfaces of pre-existing platforms, but they supplement this with humorous or radical narratives in order to subvert the intended use of the tool. So for example, in 2001, Mendy and Keith Obadike created Blackness for Sale, selling Keith's blackness like a product on eBay, citing this limited time offer with biting benefits such as this blackness may be used for accessing some affirmative action benefits, and warnings such as the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used during legal proceedings of any sort. Angela Washko created the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness in World of Warcraft in 2012, using the interface to reveal the sexism in the game's culture, which you can get if you read these comments by gamers. And using GitHub's interface, Channel 2 created open source abortion in 2014, which seems like a very relevant topic for these times. Open source abortion is an experiment contrasting the rhetoric of open source culture with the current socio-political climate in the United States. And here, Channel 2 is sharing a woman of one's own, taking charge of your reproduction without doctors. Wiki Meharis was a group in 2016 of Wikipedia users that were concerned about the diversity and neutrality, or lack thereof, of Wikipedia, and really trying to reduce this gender and culture gap. And here we see a, a video by Legacy Russell from 2020. It's called Black Mean for the website External Pages. 
She types the question, what is a black meme, into Blackal, which was a website launched by Google in 2007 to save energy with this black background. Pop-ups also offer a layer and dimensionality to an otherwise flat browser experience, um, as well as encouraging an overwhelming interactivity that's typically reserved for advertisements. So here you see a page from Brandon by Shu Li Chang from 1997. This was the first large commissioned net art piece by any large cultural institution. This one was by the Guggenheim Museum. And because it was the first of the net art medium, it's really considered a watershed moment for this movement. Um, this uses the nonlinear and partic participatory nature of the internet to illuminate the tragic story of Brandon Tina, a young transgender man who was raped and murdered in Nebraska when it was discovered that he was anatomically female. Here are two pop-ups by Bindi Girl, created in 1999. As pornography was really proliferating online in the late 90s, it was also reinforcing a lot of racial and gender stereotypes. And Prema was using this format to kind of comment on this for South Asian women. She writes, Bindi is my avatar. Not only is she her alias in the virtual world, but a play on the word, which in India means an incarnation of a Hindu deity, the embodiment of the goddess whore archetype. Bindi is neither here nor there, but exists in screenal space. And here we have two stills from Blessed Bandwidth by Shilpa Gupta from 2003. Here she invites visitors to log on, choose a religion, and get blessed. And after selecting from a range of faiths, visitors can view photographs and videos of the artists visiting that relevant place with the cable being blessed by the respective religious authority. So collage also offered a new way to add dimension and create new adaptations of older works. Here from 1995, we have Cyberflesh Girl Monster, which was created by Linda Dement, who prompted 30 women to donate scanned body parts and digital recorded sound and from these, conglomerate bodies were made. We will find you where you sleep. Do you damage? And this is the Bitch Mutant Manifesto, released in 1996 by VNS Matrix in the Mosaic browser. Um, the 3D models that you see on top are actually a modern collage by Lucas Engelhardt. A transcription of the manifesto reads, your fingers probe my neural network. The tingling sensation in the tips of your fingers are my synapses responding to your touch. It's not chemistry, it's electric. In cipher space, there are no bounds. But in spiral space, there is no they, there is only us. Suck my code. And this is a 2014 video art piece called Afro Cyber Resistance by Tabitha Razer. And in the video, she says, we need to quickly snap out of the web 2.0 fantasy of the internet as a promised land. The glitch. So the glitch is of course seen as a digital trope, but beyond the aesthetic, it's also seen as a metaphorical provocation, showing the breaking points of machines. Use the glitch as an exoskeleton of progress, writes Rosa Minkman. The glitch is a wonderful experience of an interruption that shifts an object away from its ordinary form and discourse, as written in her 2010 Glitch Studies Manifesto. And in this 2016 video, we learn of Mistress Harley and data domination, which is a subset of BDSM, where the sub offers remote access to his or her mistress uh, to, in order to have a sexual play and power play that doesn't actually involve any physical touching, but only control and consent. And here we see an adaptation and crop of VNS Matrix's A Cyber Feminist Manifesto for the 21st Century, a pioneering cyber feminist text from 1991. Which really brings me to translation. So this is the original work that was cropped in the image above. It reads, we are the modern cunt, Positive, anti-reason, unbounded, unleashed, unforgiving. We see art with our cunt, we make art with our cunt. We believe in Shuisan's madness, holiness, and poetry. We are the virus of the new world disorder, rupturing the symbolic from within saboteurs of Big Daddy mainframe. 
This was then translated into Spanish and many other languages. They also used a sort of guerrilla marketing. So here it's printed on postcards and placed in public, year, or public uh, toilets. And they also created large billboards that they plastered all over Adelaide, Australia. And here it is, wheat pasted over a, a lingerie advertisement. At the first Cyber Feminist International in 1997, participants created the 100 Antitheses, facilitated by the Old Boys Network, and rather than defining the confines of cyber feminism, they created a list of 100 theses that it was not. And here is a translation of that 100 antitheses as a poster, but instead we have pluses and minuses that are radiating out of the center. In 1997, Gita Hashemi created Steps to the Moon. And not only did this intertwine English and Farsi, it raised important questions about the politics of cyber technologies and the barriers of language. It's still very much English-centric, um, as well as access and surveillance. Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy by Cloud Kinky in 2013 tells the story of gynecological experiments on unconsenting and enslaved women. Kinky writes, sick of the body colonialism. I don't want to call the glands that makes me ejaculate rivers of pleasure with the guy's name that says that he discovered some part of my body. Anarcha was a black slave that suffered in her own flesh the experimentation of the sadist idol of Skeen, Sims. She, and only she, can name my flesh. And physicality. So many of the early works also used a sort of skeuomorphism to bring physicality and tactility into the browser. And in later works, as computing was becoming more ubiquitous, cyberfeminism was moving outside of the browser at large. So here is Flame from Sisters Online from 1994, uh, which was in Dakar. And you can see um, this texture background of a fabric in the background, which also has parallels with the jacquard loom and computing. And here we have Yohe Kurim, which was a Korean feminist collector from 1997. Their logo is this etching. Here's a close up. And Yohe translates to female, um, but in their case, they're relating it to anything feminine, which they describe as the sea, the sun, and liberation. Skin on Skin on Skin by Araya Harvey and Michael Salmon is a series of digital love letters sent in 1999. They began this romance by exchanging interactive web pages in flash, audio, text, and images. And Gain Punk was first started in 2014 by Clau Kinky, pushing forward DIY, or do it yourself, to DIWO, or DIWO, excuse me, do it with others. Among other projects, they created an open source 3D printable speculum and instructions for people without health insurance, like immigrants and sex workers, to do their own gynecological exams on their own. So many contemporary cyber feminist artists also implement extrusion in a 3D plane to give the impression of depth on the screen. So this is an additional still and logo from Tabata Rezer's Afro uh, Cyber Resistance from 2014, alongside the collage seen earlier. And here's the logo. And here, the artist Nahi Kim explores gender conventions and technologies of care. So in this 2019 project, Daddy Residency, she creates an open call for daddies to artificially inseminate and raise a child together to initiate conversations about redesigning the family structure. So using the visual metaphor of the web, as in website, and nets, as in networks, Collectives scatter text across the screen, typically as navigational elements. So here, one of the first Latin American hack feminista groups was, Wiki, was excuse me, Mujeres in Red by Montserrat Boy in 1997. Here we see a large at sign turned into a spider web, catching the nav items in its threads. And this 1998 work, Carrier, by Melinda Rackham and Damien Everett, commented on the virality of the hepatitis C virus, which also seems quite apt these days. In Velo City, or Velocity, a work made in 2000 by Tina Escaja, um, 
She calls herself an architect of a network of links and bits that contradict the presumed fluidity, alinearity, uncontrolled hypertextual poetic act, and that meeting between the verb and the nodes, between the language and the operating systems. And finally, I'd like to end with visual puns. So these use recognizable images to reveal their embedded constructs and how we might begin to interrogate them. So this is that logo from Cornelia Solfring's project, Female Extension. And this is the symbol from the previously discussed um, Gender Changers Academy. So this piece of hardware is actually called a mini gender, gender changer. And this, of course, is an outlet. So these words are kind of embedded in the hardware and software that we use. An outlet is considered female, while the cord is considered male. And something like a mini gender changer could change the input and output. And this goes further still. I believe last year, Adobe changed the master page to a parent page. And even in the uh, programming language Python, they removed master from its syntax. So as we begin to evaluate the misogynistic and colonial undertones of a lot of the things that we use, I think we can really begin to interrogate what we're using and what we're going to continue saying in the, in the attempt to change them. And I always like ending with this image of the women's web ring from 1996. Again, very low res, which I quite embrace. But this was a sticker that you could add to your website. And by clicking it, you'd be transported to any other a different randomized page of someone else in that network. I think to me what this represents is the very polyvocal and multi-authored approach to everything that we do. It's not really about the hero, it's about the communal and the collective. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much. The book is available for pre-order to give a quick plug, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you.